So let's start with the uh, Wiener operators. And uh, as I said, step one is to uh, the derive uh, And we are going to use, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to use uh, a special type of input, namely Gaussian white noise. And that was, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, critical. And you will see in, an, uh, in a little bit uh, why. And we are also going to make sure that they are all orthogonal to basically uh, Volterra operators of a uh, lower order. And basically these two features uh, uh, relate to each other. Well, the zeroth kernel, that's the easiest one. That's just the DC component in your uh, signal. So uh, K0 is just the DC component. And so we don't need to uh, work very hard to get that one. The first will be defined by taking the uh, zeroth order Volterra kernel. And realize this can be any zeroth order Volterra kernel. That's, uh, uh, I'm not going to prove that to you, but uh, that is the case. And we are saying that uh, the correlation between this uh, zeroth order uh, Volterra kernel and the first order a Wiener kernel, the correlation between these two is zero. And since I'm assuming that the system is, uh, that the signals are all uh, stationary and ergodic, uh, I'm actually, since they are ergodic, I can use a uh, time average. And uh, recall that these triangular brackets just mean a time average. It's an integral over an interval divided by the length of the interval. And then the second one, I can uh, have the same demand here, that it is independent from the zeroth order one. like that. But of course, it also has to be independent from the first order one. I'm just uh, doing dots here because I don't want to repeat, uh, keep repeating all this uh, stuff. But it basically is the same here. That's xt and that's k2, k1, 2, k0, 2, xt. And we will stop here in our derivation. You could go on, of course, with the third and the fourth and the fifth. But in this case, I'm just going to show you the principles. Now let us start with this one. And you can read that also on page 65. And let's write this out. First of all, the zeroth order uh, Volterra kernel is also just, an, uh, in this case, a uh, DC term. And then I'm going to write the first order one.
So the only thing I did is I uh, replaced the uh, operator here by the kernel, because it's just a DC term. And I replaced the G operator here by the full expression plus the derived expression. Right? And again, these derived expressions are necessary to make them orthogonal. Now let's uh, have a look at this uh, expression. I am taking the time average of uh, this, uh, uh, this expression. And now I am going to make the assumption uh, that I may exchange or interchange the operations. So Basically, there is an, uh, an integral involved here eh, for the time average. And there is an integral involved there for the time average. And I'm going to assume that I can interchange them. If I do that, I can just say, OK, I'm going this expression. And my time average, I haven't done yet. But uh, let's say that uh, I'm going to uh, now move this time average. I'll give it a different color to show you where it goes. If I took the time average of, uh, of this one, it's not very interesting, is it? It's a constant. So a time average of a constant is a constant. So I can just leave that. The same thing is uh, hopefully true for uh, k1, which is the kernel. I hope that that kernel is constant. Otherwise, we do not deal with an LTI or an NLTI system. Uh, the input x is not constant. So I will have to uh, put them here. Then uh, here, the, uh, the derived kernel here, it's a zeroed order one. It's going to be a constant again. So again, I don't need to. Uh, so you can see that basically I can now move my averaging brackets really easily uh, around the input instead of around the whole expression. And now you see why it is actually pretty convenient that we have chosen Gaussian white noise with a zero mean. Because now what is the uh, expression or what is the, the result of the average of, uh, of this, well, by definition, that is 0. So that thing vanishes. And uh, recall that this whole expression had to be 0. Yeah. So that means that uh, the only way that this is uh, actually going to be uh, uh, 0 is when, uh, in this case, this is 0 as well. So in this particular case, uh, uh, the k not 1, uh, the derived kernel, uh, doesn't play a role. It's, uh, so now I can uh, draw my conclusion that, therefore, uh, I can now write down that g1 Basically, nothing else than this. And this is my result for the first Wiener operator. Any questions about this? Why is zero and not zero? This expression is zero. The only way that that is going to happen is if this is zero.
because this is not zero. This is zero, so this has to be zero. I should say that uh, H not could be zero, but it doesn't have to be. So for that reason, you have to assume the case where it's not zero, and then it has to be like that. Is that clear? Now, one important aspect, and uh, you will see that that is actually true for all the expectations of all the kernels, except, of course, for the zeroth order one, is that the expectation of G1, or in this case, the uh, time average of Z1, G1 is zero. And you can easily uh, see that if you put again these uh, uh, triangular brackets around this expression and you do the same trick as we were doing here, then the triangular brackets will add, end up around this x. That thing will then evaluate to 0. And that means that the uh, expectation of G1 vanishes. Take this away, so any more questions before I take it out? No? So now let's uh, look at the, uh, the next one, the second order one. And for the second order one, we have actually two equations. And that's, uh, that's very really appropriate, of course, because we have two unknowns here, eh? the, this one and that one. We have the two derived uh, kernels here. So it's actually pre pretty good that we have uh, two equations. So let's first look at the first one. Again, I'm going to write it down uh, in full now. Let's look at this expression for, an, uh, for a moment. I again replaced the zeroth order operator for the constant here, h naught. And then in between the square brackets, I have uh, the expression for g2. That expression consists of a second order term, a derived first order term, and a derived zeroth order term. See? And then I take the time average. And that thing has to be zero. Now I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, assume that uh, I am going to uh, move these things uh, to the places where they belong. So I am assuming that I can uh, interchange the uh, uh, operation. 
something I can do on the blackboard really easily now. So I'm just going to wipe these uh, guys out. And then again, if I apply the time average to uh, H0, that's constant. So K2, same thing here. I will have to uh, apply the average. And here I have to apply the average. And again, here I don't have to. Just have a look on the blackboard, and uh, let's look at this. Uh, uh, let's look at this expression. Um, we can immediately say that uh, this thing is going to be zero again, isn't it? The average, so this term is going to vanish. And then the top one is not going to vanish because that was. Uh, as we discussed last time, that was the uh, correlation of Gaussian white noise. And the correlation of Gaussian white noise is nothing else than, in this case, the variance times the delta function, because that is only non-zero if uh, tau 1 and tau 2 are equal to each other. So if I now uh, write this result, I uh, get the following expression. Because that uh, third ter or second term vanishes, I only there are two terms that uh, remain. Now this is again a uh, double integral, but uh, we love again integrals with uh, delta functions because they are so easy to uh, evaluate, and so I can use uh, I can actually pick <laughs> which one I want. I could replace tau two by tau one or tau one by tau two doesn't really matter which integral I'm uh, evaluating. Um, but uh, one of the two uh, I can easily uh, evaluate. And since this whole expression, again, has to be 0, I can now uh, 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 get uh, the result for uh, my derived Wiener kernel. So this is an uh, important result. And one of the things that you should realize when you see this expression is that uh, this derived uh, kernel is uniquely derived from the second uh, kernel. So, so although it is a zeroed order uh, component, it is completely derived from the second order kernel. In fact, I should have corrected that. Uh, of course, this follows from, not from this part, but uh, 
it follows uh, this expression follows from this expression. I think that was clear, but the way I had written it down with this arrow was uh, confusing. Now you see that uh, <coughs> the whole reasoning is uh, is pretty simple. Um, it's they are long expressions, so there is always risk that you make a little uh, mistake when you copy these long expressions, but but it's not difficult. You just write a full expression. You have your uh, averaging brackets. You apply the averaging brackets to your input signal because that's the only thing that uh, changes with time. And then you apply what you know about your uh, signal. And you see again and again why it is actually so smart to use Gaussian white noise because that allows you to uh, simplify these expressions uh, uh, consistently. Uh, makes it easy. If you uh, apply the whole thing, uh, the same approach, which you can actually see on uh, pages 67 and 68, you will actually find that if you kind of follow the logic, the same logic, the outcome is that uh, the other derived uh, second order kernel uh, vanishes with zero. Just as we had uh, the zero one vanish, that uh, one two will vanish too. And with these results, I can now uh, write down what uh, my uh, second uh, Wiener operator is going to be. And I will write that here on top. My second uh, operator Then I'm just going to substitute that part in there. And this is my result. And of course, this part is uh, also, uh, you can uh, use the shorthand uh, K02 for that. Again, here, it's uh, important to realize that uh, the uh, expectation of G2 In this case, uh, again, the same as the time average, also vanishes. And you can again see that uh, very easily if you uh, put around this uh, G2 expression the, the time average brackets. And then uh, the time average brackets will end up around uh, the input here. And if you do that, uh, you will get again uh, 
sigma squared uh, times the delta function that evaluates to exactly the same expression as this. So you get the same expression minus the same expression is again zero. So it's, and that is actually really important uh, to realize that uh, all these uh, expectations, uh, and that's another thing that's important, uh, they just vanish. If you're actually interested in seeing the higher order stuff, uh, um, there is a book by uh, uh, Schetzen uh, that has been uh, uh, re, uh, reprinted. Uh, it's an older book. It has been reprinted uh, recently. And they basically show you uh, how you can keep going to uh, end order uh, Wiener kernels. Although theoretically of interest, uh, computationally, we still have to wait until we get really faster computers because these things are computationally really, really, really intense. So uh, that's the reason that uh, most papers won't go beyond the second order, maybe the third order, but that's, uh, that's, that's about it. Um, there is also a couple of people that have developed uh, uh, an, uh, kind of a regressive uh, uh, method to determine Volterra kernels, and they can go also a little bit higher in order. But then I'm talking fifth, sixth, seventh order, not uh, 20th or 23rd order. That, uh, that becomes really uh, yeah, uh, computationally very, very intense. The name Sketson um, brings me to the second uh, part, which is to determine uh, the kernels. And uh, that method is known as the Lee Schetzen method. And Schetzen is the, bo the, the, the person who wrote that uh, textbook. Let me ask you this. Uh, any idea how we could uh, get a zeroth order kernel? Zero to the average, yeah. That's, that's actually relatively the easiest one. So if you have, let's say, a an, uh, an, uh, time series that you uh, model with a uh, Wiener uh, series, then the only thing that you really need to do is, uh, again, take the average of your time series. And since I mentioned to you that every uh, Wiener operator vanishes when you average it, the only one that doesn't vanish is, uh, is the first one. So that, that's an easy one. Now the, the first uh, order kernel, and that's kind of uh, the reason why this is called the uh, cross-correlation method from uh, uh, Lee Schetzen, is uh, you take your signal. Well, let's say that this is your signal, and that the input to your uh, The input to your system is, uh, is uh, x. 
and, and then you take uh, the time average. So here you have your uh, cross-correlation uh, expression, the time average of the product of the two. And I'm using now uh, a V uh, to indicate the delay, because I'm kind of g running a little bit out of symbols. Otherwise, I have to uh, start having tau 10 at some point in time. And basically, if I do that, uh, I would have, uh, again, in between these uh, average brackets, uh, I have this one. Again, if my system is modeled by this series and I multiply this with uh, x, I can basically uh, is the same thing as multiplying each of the operators. Now, an important thing to realize is the following, that uh, this expression can be seen as a Volterra operator. And um, if you want to see the convincing proof of that, you should read Appendix 4.1. But considering that this um, expression is the, uh, in this case, the first order Volterra operator, I can uh, look at this thing again and say, well, you know what? Uh, this thing has a higher order. This is a second order. And this is a first order. This is an end order. This is a first order. These things are designed so that they are independent from lower order Volterra. So these guys go. And the only two that I need to consider are these. Because this is the equal order, and this is a higher order than the Wiener operator. And then the next question becomes, if I look at these two remaining terms, you have any idea what would happen with this term? Just apply the same trick that I did before, just uh, start uh, applying these uh, averages to the part that are uh, relevant. So This is a constant. This is the signal. So since this is Gaussian white noise, this thing will vanish too. See? So that's the nice thing. If I do a cross-correlation with one copy of the output with one copy of the input, I basically get uh, uh, the only uh, thing that survives in this expression is the expression for G1. So we should probably write that out in full, create again some space.
signal which is gaussian white noise yeah what is it that happens to the first order term that's because the expression actually has the correlation between yeah let's kind of write this thing out then you will see okay. it yeah All because right. this is a constant times noise so that okay. means that is a constant times the average of noise which means zero Let's write this thing out completely, then you will actually see it, I think. So let's kind of write, uh, for G1, let's write the whole thing. if you look at this expression now you see that here I cannot say oh yeah this evaluates to zero because there is another mm -hmm. term here so I cannot do that and so I'm going to import this thing in the in the whole expression And again, I'm going to uh, move these uh, average brackets that are here to here. And now you see that this thing does not uh, evaluate to uh, 0. Because if I evaluate that, I will get... Uh, This delta function is it. And again, this is one of our integrals, and this is just a single integral, so that's even easier with the delta function. We love to evaluate them, so we're just going to plug in, uh, in this case, uh, v1 for tau1. And this whole thing simplifies to this. And if we now put everything together here, what we have here, eh, so this is the expression we started with. That's the only thing that survived. And if we now solve for the first uh, kernel here, we find finally that This is the expression that we uh, that we get for uh, k1, and you can see that we can uh, determine the first Wiener kernel, k1, by doing a cross correlation of the output with the input, and we have to divide and scale it by the variance of the uh, input. And of course, uh, if you are smart, you use a variance of one. So then. It's just a cross-correlation between the two. And you see that again and again and again. The principle is you write down the expression. You have uh, uh, average brackets. You apply the average brackets to the part of the signal that varies. Then you evaluate what the uh, outcome is. And because we deal with Gaussian white noise, that is uh, relatively simple. 
and then we uh, we just simply solve uh, for this uh, for this case. So we now know that uh, if we have a Wiener series, uh, the first uh, kernel is just the DC component, and the second kernel we determine from the correlation between the output with the uh, with the input. I'm going to explain the overall procedure with you by projecting figure 4.2. Let's, uh, let's look at this diagram and see what the uh, procedure is for the uh, Lee Schetzen uh, method. Um, what we have as, uh, as the basis is a nonlinear system. And that nonlinear system gets a Gaussian white noise with zero mean as input. And it gets an, uh, an output, uh, uh, in this case, uh, z. And I'm using here the uh, uh, symbols xw and zzw. That is because we are going to do this in MATLAB in a little bit. And these are the names of the variables that we use in the MATLAB program. But uh, yeah, this was x in our uh, development here and z in our development there. So the first thing that we do, that's step one, is we determine what the average is. And once we have determined that, we have the zeroth order Wiener kernel. What we actually do in this particular uh, case, in the algorithm, is that we often, not always, but often, we actually subtract the contribution of each of the previous ones. Although theoretically that should not be necessary, since the amount of noise that we present is always limited, it gives you a better result if you, uh, if you just subtract it. It corrects for the fact that you have a finite uh, uh, epoch of noise. So basically you get a residual uh, V0 here, which is the uh, original output minus what we estimated here as the zeroth order kernel. So in this case, we just subtract the average. That's step two. Then once we have that, we uh, do step three. And step three is what we just uh, uh, finished discussing. We are doing a cross-correlation between the output, in this case the corrected output, and the input. And that will give us an idea of what uh, K1 is, the first order kernel. Now we want to subtract the contribution of that first order kernel as well. And so that is, uh, uh, requires an extra step relative to the theoretical algorithm. We actually convolve, because this is nothing else than the kernel, than the uh, the unit impulse response in this case, if it were a first order system. We uh, convolve this kernel with the input and then subtract it from, again, what we had here as uh, uh, V0, and we get V1. So V1 is basically the output corrected for the contributions of the zeroth and the first order kernels. And then, as a next step, we say, well, we take that output again, the corrected output, and now we are cross-correlating it, and we haven't done that, but that you, you can kind of see the picture now uh, emerging, is now you uh, cross-correlate it with two copies of the uh, input. And lo and behold, that will give you your uh, second-order uh, kernel. And of course, you could do a second-order convolution, subtract it from this, make a correlation with three copies of the input, and so you could kind of keep going. In, uh, but this is the the general principle. So I thought it would be uh, uh, nice because last uh, lecture we did a um, um, analysis uh, using the Volterra uh, series to do uh, to look at a higher order system to take that system and now instead of using the Volterra now pretend we don't know the system and use the Wiener uh, approach. So if you open MATLAB, and you, uh, 
run program four underscore one. That's basically the same uh, system as in program three underscore one. Uh, so you get the same question about this uh, RC do DT, and then you get a bunch of figures. A number of them will look very, very familiar. It also will take a little bit of time. Uh, that's because these uh, these computations with uh, with the noise uh, take uh, take uh, quite a while. But in the end, you will get nine figures. Now let's look at what they mean. Okay, figure one. That is our uh, uh, second order uh, Volterra kernel, as we uh, as we know it. Uh, we we use the system uh, with the filter and the squarer, and so we knew that this was going to be the second order uh, Volterra kernel. So that's the one you have seen already. Then the next step, figure two, is. Uh, again the diagonal of that uh, kernel which is the unit impulse response then figure three again is trivial but it shows you that the unit impulse response uh, stays the same at different uh, times so we have a time invariant system and then figure four is also the one we have seen already this is the estimation of the volterra kernel um, as we uh, did it uh, with uh, uh, pairs of uh, pulses Now we are going to go to the Wiener part of the uh, estimate. And figure five, the top and the bottom, shows you a little bit of the characteristics of the uh, input signal. Uh, the top is the autocorrelation, uh, which is nice, isn't it? Because you can see that it's close to zero, except when the delay is, uh, uh, is uh, zero. And uh, I, uh, I have not, I, my, uh, I've, I've made my life easy. I haven't even bothered uh, calibrating the scale. That's not an example you should follow. You should be, uh, uh, you should basically make sure that your time scale is correct. Because of course, uh, here in the middle is where delay is zero. Here is positive delay, and there is negative delay. And then the other thing is that I showed you the amplitude distribution. And you can see that although it is, of course, a bit limited because it's not an infinite time series, you can see it is a Gaussian one. Then we go to figure six. And figure six, just uh, to give you an impression, shows you the uh, input uh, of the system in black and what the system produces as an output in red. Figure seven. That's an estimate of the first order Wiener kernel. Are you surprised by this result? What does it look like to you? Huh? More or less zero, yeah, it looks a little bit a noisy uh, signal. Eh? As you can see, it is, uh, it's a small signal. It fluctuates around zero. And you have to multiply the units by 10 to the minus 3. So it's a bit of a noisy zero line. And that's a little bit to be expected, because there is really not a first order uh, kernel here. We have a pure second order system. And then last but not least, oh no, not last, almost last, but certainly not least, here we have the second order Wiener kernel. And you can see that in this particular case, uh, if you have low order systems, uh, the Wiener kernels and the Volterra kernels, uh, and certainly in this case, they are identical. See? So the, Wiener's, the Wiener approach is, uh, is a good way of uh, 
estimating what your Volterra, uh, uh, Volterra uh, kernels would be. Of course, if you have higher order systems because of all these uh, uh, non-homogeneous terms, uh, you get deviations from that. And, but you can compute what they are. So it's not, uh, it's not too terrible. And then just uh, uh, for, for my own uh, benefit, uh, because you always want to check whether what you're doing is reasonable, I also computed the second order uh, convolution with this kernel and then s kind of checked uh, how well I could predict my signal that I uh, simulated with my uh, Wiener series, second order Wiener series. And that's the last figure. And you can see that the uh, output uh, of uh, these uh, 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 kernels with the uh, real output, which is red and green, Green is what I predict, and red is what I, uh, what I get. As you see that I do a fairly reasonable job. And if you quantify it, you can actually see that in the text here. That's the variance that I can explain with my model. And in this case, you can see that 92.6% uh, of my uh, variance can be explained by this second order model. So although that I have used a uh, Wiener approximation using a limited amount of noise, uh, which kind of makes you, uh, leads to the expectation that you will approximate it, you will not be very, very good. You see that I, you do, a, even in this case, you do a fairly reasonable uh, job, because if you can explain uh, almost 93% of your signal, it's not too bad. Huh? You could, yeah. You could say, well, I'm, I'm happy, for instance, if I do 70 or 80 percent. But you could also say, well, if it's only 70 or 80 percent, I would like to go to a third or a fourth order system. Yeah, you could lengthen your epoch. Then you will do a better job. It might, it might, because of course uh, uh, there will, in the, in the residue, there may also be a third order component, but that would be an artifact uh, in that case. Just as we had a little bit of a first, a non zero uh, part in our first order kernel, you may get uh, non zero parts in the, uh, what you could do then is you could do it multiple times and then average it. And if, if that averages out, that kind of gives you the clue that uh, it probably is not something real. That, uh, that you get. But if you uh, know uh, beforehand that it is a second order system and your Wiener series doesn't do well, you either made a programming mistake or you need to kind of uh, lengthen your, uh, 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 your epoch for the noise. Actually, you will see a couple of examples in the, in the next uh, few minutes and also the next lecture. I'm going to let you uh, read a paper on this, uh, on this uh, method. So you do, uh, in general, you do pretty good with two orders. So it's not too bad. Any other questions before we talk a little bit about practical uh, applications? So since we are interested all here in uh, neuroscience, we should talk uh, about uh, applications of uh, this in, uh, in neuroscience. And An important thing to kind of consider in neuroscience is if you have uh, either a network or a neuron or a piece of a neuron, 
if you assume that it is a nonlinear uh, time invariant system, you deal with some input, then you deal with some output. Huh? But in neuroscience, um, um, the input can be uh, indeed continuous, as we just had in, um, let's say, uh, a noisy type of uh, signal that could, for instance, be a noise that you deliver to your ear. And then you are providing noise to the auditory system. Or you could do, uh, let's say, a noisy input to a neuron. Uh, if you clamp, voltage clamp a neuron, you could basically provide noise to that neuron or to the network that, that uh, is. Uh. But as you know, uh, we also may have uh, an impulse input, eh, because some neurons basically uh, get uh, spike trains as, uh, as an input. And that's, in a way, is, uh, is the same way for the output. Uh, some neurons or some parts of neurons will give a gradual, continuous uh, output. Uh, the retina cells are examples of that. So people who work in the retina, they basically, uh, unless you look into the ganglion cells, you get graded responses, uh, which is kind of like continuous. Yeah. But of course, many cells basically spike and give you uh, impulses. So roughly speaking, we have uh, four uh, possibilities. Eh? If you have the input and the output, you can have continuous in and continuous out. You can have continuous in and impulses out. Uh, for instance, if I stimulate uh, the cochlea and I measure the uh, response in the auditory nerve. I can have pulsed inputs and continuous uh, output. And I can have pulsed inputs and pulsed outputs. Now let me use I here because I used impulse instead of pulse. Now, in these two cases, as you will see, we can use the standard Wiener approach as we just discussed. In these two cases, we cannot. Because, uh, uh, I mean, impulses are not Gaussian white noise. So that, uh, and um, the good news is that if you still would like to apply that, you can actually uh, modify the Wiener approach for uh, impulses. In that case, you have to assume that the impulse trains, or you have to make sure, if you deliver it yourself, that the impulse trains are uh, Poissonian, so basically random. For that reason, they, these things are uh, called Poisson Wiener series. And because of the time uh, this year, we won't get to that. But if you're ever interested in it, uh, the whole derivation and the way that uh, you have to deal with that is uh, described in chapter 5. It's completely analogous to what we did in the Wiener series, which is uh, described in uh, chapter 4. The idea is completely the same. You, uh, uh, you basically... Uh, uh, Make, uh, make your input in such a way that it's easy to interpret the time averages of your input. And then when you do that, you, uh, you apply much of the same principles as you, uh, as you have just seen uh, this lecture for the standard Wiener series. So what we are going to do is uh, look at a uh, specific example. You have a question? Two questions. So for the impulse input, mm -hmm. uh, why can't we use the Volterra series? Well, you cannot use a Volterra series because Volterra series 1 do not have independent terms. 
that's the that's the major uh, that's the major reason, isn't it? And, uh, you could derive the Volterra kernels from the Wiener kernels, but not the other way around. Yeah, no. Because in the Wiener series, you know that there is independence, so you can determine then. And then from that, you can go back to, uh, to Volterra, but not the other way around. There is an, uh, a nice paper, and it's actually available on chalk, uh, by uh, Recchio Spinoso. and collaborators. It's a 2005 paper in uh, J Neurophys. And uh, in the book, uh, there is a little bit further explanation on uh, page uh, 79. And this paper is available on chalk. And the idea is, uh, is this, that they, uh, they, have, they have done measurements uh, uh, on the auditory system. So if this is the cochlea and this is the, uh, let's say, the auditory uh, nerve, they have uh, provided uh, an, uh, an, a sound, a noisy sound input. So it is sound, but at the same time, it, is, uh, it, it satisfies the criteria for Gaussian white noise. They uh, put that into the cochlea, and they measure the output. And so they get spike trains at the output, while they have a continuous uh, uh, signal at the input. So we're having uh, exactly this example. Right? We have continuous input and impulses as uh, output. And let's say that uh, we have here uh, an output Y with uh, spikes at uh, T1, T2, T3, Ti, Tn. Then we can represent uh, this output uh, also as an, a set of uh, unit impulses. And here you see a different use of the unit uh, impulse. I'm now saying, you know what, for the spikes, the only thing that I'm really interested in in this spike is the timing. So I can just represent this as a uh, set of unit, uh, unit impulses. And so now I have a mathematical expression for my input, which is Gaussian white noise with a certain variance and zero mean. And I have a uh, mathematical expression for my output, which is then uh, a sigma of a bunch of uh, delta functions that represent uh, the time delays, or the times where the spikes occur. And now you can start using the same Lee Sketson method that we have been using in the previous example, we can say, oh, for the uh, zeroed uh, kernel, I just have to uh, do uh, the average of my uh, output, which is uh, nothing else than This expression. So now what will we do? In order to evaluate this, we do the same thing as we have been uh, doing before. We just exchange or interchange the operations. And um, in that case, uh, I will write that down here. In that case, we get first 1 over t. Um, let's kind of first write that down uh, in full. So 
now instead of the triangular brackets, I write it uh, as a real-time average uh, with an integral. And now I'm going to interchange my uh, operation. And this is a very simple one, of course, because the delta function, as long as ti is within the interval 0 to capital T, will every time will be a 1, isn't it? Because the area was always defined as 1. That's how we defined it all the way in the beginning. And we have to do that n times. So this becomes n times a 1. And so this whole thing becomes uh, n over t, which is just the number of spikes over the time interval that I'm looking at. So it's basically your, uh, your base rate of uh, spiking and uh, not. So next uh, week, um, on Monday, there is Memorial Day, so there won't be a lecture. Then on the Wednesday, uh, we are going to spend uh, the second half of the lecture uh, to uh, discuss the, the first part of that question that you also need to do for your exam. Because since you don't have a homework uh, session on Monday, that will give you the opportunity to uh, do that in the second uh, part of the next week, Wednesday's lecture. And the first part of the Wednesday's lecture, I would like to spend uh, discussing with you this paper. So basically, your homework for next week is to read this, uh, uh, this paper. And as a matter of fact, you will be one of the few worldwide neuroscientists who will be able to understand this paper. <laughs> 